This is going to be the next lesson for the Institute. We're going to be looking at the times of the Gentiles. And this time runs from about 606 B.C. all the way up to the second coming. Now, here's a quick review. Remember that keeping the nation of Israel in mind really helps you with the Old Testament and your whole Bible. Thinking about the condition of the nation of Israel. In Genesis, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his 12 sons, you saw what we called the formulation of the nation of Israel and how they ended up in Egypt. In Exodus, when they were under the bondage of Pharaoh, and then they're exiting Egypt, you saw the calling out of the nation of Israel. When you get into First and Second Samuel, you see King Saul and King David and King Solomon, and this is where you see the establishment of the nation of Israel. And at the end of Solomon's reign, he gets into idolatry, and this is where you see the beginning of the demise of the nation of Israel. And you have Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And that kicks the demise into high gear. Jeroboam starts them off with a false idolatrous religion. And all the kings of Israel pretty much after that just follow his leading on that. And this leads to the destruction of of the nation of Israel where you're going to see the king of Assyria take over the northern kingdom which is called the kingdom of Israel the ten northern tribes this happens in 2nd Kings 17 and you also see Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon take the kingdom of Judah captive which is the southern kingdom made up of Judah and Benjamin that's 2 Kings 24 through 25 and 2 Chronicles 36. So both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom are taken captive. And you see the crown fallen from the head of Israel. And there's a verse in Lamentations chapter 5 that shows you that Israel lost the crown of the kingdom. In Lamentations 5.16 it says, The crown has fallen from our head Woe well, unto us that we have sinned. They don't get the crown back until the fullness of the Gentiles. They're not getting the crown back until the times of the Gentiles is over. And the times of the Gentiles is not over until the Lord comes back. And the kingdoms of this world become the Lord, the Lord's kingdoms. And Israel will get their land. And in the books of the kings, you saw the establishment of the nation of Israel and the establishment of the kingdom of heaven for them. And the kingdom of heaven, remember, has to do with a phys physical, visible kingdom on this earth. But when Israel and Judah go into captivity, this was the end of the kingdom of heaven for Israel for now. God turns over the world to the Gentile nations and Judah is in captivity for 70 years. As it talks about in Jeremiah 25, 11, it says, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So when Judah is taken captive, I want to show you that when they were taken captive, Nebuchadnezzar actually takes them captive in three waves. Like I said, this starts in 606 B.C. So now I've gave you a little review. I've told you a little bit about what we're going to talk about. Now we're going to start at the beginning of it and work our way down. So when Nebuchadnezzar comes through to take them captive, he does it in three waves. The first is in 606 B.C., during the reign of a king named Jehoiakim. And this is in 2 Kings 24, 1 through 2. It says, In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant three years. 
Then he turned and rebelled against him. And the Lord sent against him bands of the Chaldees and bands of the Syrians and bands of the Moabites and bands of the children of Ammon and sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord which he spake by his servants, the prophets. You see, Judah had gotten off into wickedness and sin and had the sins of Jeroboam even though they were not the northern kingdom. The sins of Jeroboam had done leaked over into the southern kingdom as well. And since there's so much idolatry, wickedness, and sin, and turning from God throughout all these years, God's cup of wrath is full, and he's going to pour it out on top of their head, and he's sending an enemy in. Just like at the end of Solomon's reign, he had an enemy raised up against him. His wives had turned away his heart, and he had to have an enemy rise up against him. It's just like that in your life. You continue in your sin, doing wicked stuff, doing what you're not supposed to do. You're going to end up having an enemy raised up against you to be a thorn in your flesh, to cause you trouble. Whether it be on the job, whether it be a spouse, whatever. God will allow an enemy to come up against you as a judgment. Just like here. Here comes Nebuchadnezzar. 606 BC. And all these other guys here. Came up against Judah to destroy it. And. Right here where Nebuchadnezzar comes through. And takes some people captive. This is where the book of Daniel comes in. Because Daniel is taken captive. During this first wave. So if you've never. Really knew. Where the book of Daniel comes in, that's where it comes in, right here. And remember all those prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, all those prophets. You can look at the beginning of those prophets and it'll tell you where they line up. For example, look at Daniel 1.1. It says in Daniel 1.1, 1, 1, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So there you have it. There you see it. Daniel lines up with 2 Kings 24 where you got Jehoiakim on the throne and Nebuchadnezzar coming through to take them captive. And so these major and minor prophets, they line up with these kings. And the easiest way to figure out where they line up is just turn to them, look at the first, first or second verses of each one of them and you find out which king they line up with, which time period they go to. So Daniel is taken captive in the first wave. And when you're in the book of Daniel, you see the devil is still attacking the seed. In Daniel 1.3, it says, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well-favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So there you see, he wants the best one, the best ones. And the devil would love to take you and use your talent if you're skillful, cunning, understanding and have such as ability to stand you see that he would love to take you and your talents and use it for his glory and honor instead of letting you use it for god's glory and honor but what they wanted to do was take these take this king's seed take them and corrupt them they wanted to teach them their way of doing things just like the devil wants to do with me and you today. Me and you are in Christ, so we are counted for the seed. And the devil is doing all he can to corrupt me and you. He wants 
corrupt communication to proceed out of your mouth as Paul talks against. He wants you to be as many that corrupt the word of God. Uh, he wants you to walk in your former conversation which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. He wants to add some corruption in there. He wants to corrupt the seed. He is trying his best to attack the seed back here in the book of Daniel. So he gets all the king's seed. And if you have read Daniel, then you know that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, also known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they changed their names. They didn't let the world corrupt them. They didn't let Nebuchadnezzar and them guys get to them. Daniel, like Joseph, can actually interpret dreams. And I'm telling you that because one of the dreams he interprets really lays out the times of the Gentiles that we're studying right now. The topic, the times of the Gentiles we're studying today is laid out in one of the dreams that Daniel interprets. Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, King of Babylon, the one that take, took him captive, he has a dream about an image. And Daniel explains to him what that image is. And this is where Daniel starts getting some popularity. And Daniel is going to show him that the image he saw actually lays out the Gentile nations that will be in power all the way up until the fullness of the Gentiles. That is all the way up until the Antichrist and the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's look at this dream and this image in Daniel chapter 2, 31 through 34. It says, Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. Now here's the image. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hand, cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them in pieces. So let's look at each piece of this image and it's going to lead from Nebuchadnezzar the start of the times of the Gentiles all the way down to where it says a stone cut without hands and that's the Lord Jesus Christ at the second coming okay so the first one is a head of gold the first one it says this image's head was a fine gold this head of gold is going to be Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon and this begins 606 B.C. with the captivity. Then you have his breast and his arms of silver. The breast and arms of silver will be Persia under King Darius, who defeats Nebuchadnezzar around 536 B.C. Then you got belly and thighs of brass. The belly and thighs of brass will be Alexander the Great of Greece, who defeats Persia around 330 B.C. Then it says his legs of iron. The legs of iron will be the Roman Empire around 200 B.C. Rome defeats Alexander the Great. It's got two legs of iron representing pagan Rome and papal Rome. Then you get into where it says his feet part of iron and part of clay. That will be the Antichrist kingdom. Then it says the stone cut without hands. That's the Lord Jesus Christ who breaks the Antichrist kingdom in pieces at the second coming, ending the times of the Gentiles. It says thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands. And that has to do with the virgin birth. Jesus Christ is the stone of stumbling and the rock of offense. He's cut without hands. That shows you the virgin birth, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. That's what he does to the Antichrist and his kingdom. And if you can get that down in your Bible and remember that you, uh, from the head of gold down to the stone cut without hands, you're going to have a good little outline of the times of the Gentiles. 
you're going to have a good grasp of the times of the Gentiles. So the first wave was in 606 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar came through. He took Daniel captive. He got Jehoiakim. Then you got the second wave under Jehoiakim in 598 B.C. This is still Nebuchadnezzar here with the second wave. Coming through in the second wave in 2 Kings 24, 10 through 12. It says, At that time the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city, and his servants did besiege it. They got all around it. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, went out to the king of Babylon. He and his mother and his servants and his princes and his officers and the king of Babylon took him in the eighth year of his reign. So Nebuchadnezzar surrounded Jehoiakim in Jerusalem and nobody could come out. Nobody could go in. When he did this, he cut off their supply. That's exactly what's, what's the, what the devil wants to do to you. He wants to cut off your supply. He wants to cut off your prayer life. He wants to cut off your Bible reading. He wants to cut off your Christian fellowship. He don't want nothing coming in. He don't want nothing going out. If he can do this, then all he has to do is just sit around and wait for you to die. And he would love to just camp out around you with his devils and besiege you. And it says in 2 Kings 24, 15, And he carried away Jehoiakim to Babylon and the king's mother and the king's wives and his officers and the mighty of the land, those he carried those carried he into captivity from Jerusalem to Babylon. So remember, you had Daniel taken in the first wave when, Jehoi when Nebuchadnezzar came through. Now, this would be when Ezekiel was taken captive. And you can find this out by simply looking at the beginning of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kibar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river of Kibar, and the hand of the Lord was there upon him. So the third wave of Nebuchadnezzar comes through in 588 B.C. with Zedekiah on the throne. We've seen the first wave in 606 B.C. with Jehoiakim on the throne. We've seen the second wave as under Jehoiakim in 598 B.C. And that's when Ezekiel's taken. And now you're going to see the third wave of Nebuchadnezzar Coming through happens in 588 B.C. with King Zedekiah on the throne. Now, Zedekiah, a little bit of different situation. Zedekiah is actually Nebuchadnezzar's father's brother. And Nebuchadnezzar makes Zedekiah, his father's brother, king in Judah after Jehoiakim. But then Zedekiah himself rebels against Babylon himself. 2 Kings 24, 17 through 20. And the king of Babylon made Madaniah, his father's brother, king in his stead, and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 20 and 1 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hamutel, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he did that which was evil on the side of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For through the anger of the Lord it came to pass in Jerusalem and Judah until he had cast them out from his presence that Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. And you read about it again in Second Chronicles 36, 13, where it says, And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who made him swear by God, but he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, 
rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Notice that. They mocked the messengers of God. They despised his words. They misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people. What do you see people doing today? They mock the messengers of God. They definitely despise his words. And they misuse his prophets. The people speaking for God. They have no use for it. And then verse 17. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man, or him that stooped for age, he gave them all into his hand, and all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his princes, and all these he brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of God, and break down the wall of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And then that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. Three score and ten years is 70 years. This is a 70-year captivity. Once you get past the 70 years of captivity, that is where the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther come in. So that's where those books line up in your Bible. And also, the minor prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. That's where they're going to show up. But what happens is King Cyrus is going to give a decree for the Jews to go back to Jerusalem. And this going back will be covered in Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. Now, on the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. So there's going to be a remnant go back to Jerusalem, and you're going to see them in uh, Ezra and Nehemiah. In Nehemiah, they re rebuild the wall. And in Ezra, they rebuild the temple. And in those, you see the prophets Haggai and Zechariah encourage the remnant who goes back to Jerusalem to continue rebuilding the wall and the temple. And Malachi, the last prophet, he's the last prophet to the re restored remnant. So you can now see how all these prophets that you see towards the end of your Old Testament, you can see how they fit into the story of the Old Testament in your Bible. Primarily, for the most part, most of them are either prophesying to the kings of Israel and Judah before the captivity about their sin, or they're encouraging that remnant after the seven-year captivity. They're encouraging them, to, encouraging them to continue rebuilding the wall, continue rebuilding the temple. And you see, the prophets are, are they're either pre-captivity, during captivity, or post-captivity. And that's how you can remember them. And if you forget where they line up, just simply go to that prophet, look at the first couple of verses, and it'll tell you where they fit in in this timeline. So that's the times of the Gentiles. Now we're going to talk about the 400 silent years. And 
obviously during the 400 silent years the times of the gentiles is still going on because it's still going on right now and it's going to go on all the way up until the second coming of the lord jesus but the 400 silent years specifically between the book of malachi the last book of the old testament and the first coming of christ this is the 400 silent years During those 400 silent years, God doesn't move any holy men of God to speak as they're moved by the Holy Ghost. During this 400 silent years, men had to get what God said through the Old Testament that was already written. During this 400 silent years, the devil is establishing a godless world through those Gentile nations. You see, back before in the book of Genesis... He used the sons of God to mess things up in Genesis chapter 6. Then when the Jews were out of the promised land in Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, he used the giants to mess things up and stand in their way. And in the 400 silent years, he gets Roman power with a great foothold so that when Jesus Christ shows up, God's people are in bondage to Rome just like they were in bondage to Egypt back in Exodus. And during this time, you have the development of the Pharisees and the Sadducees during that 400 silent years. You don't find them in the Old Testament. You find them in the Gospels. And the devil develops them to do something. You can probably guess what it is. It's to attack the seed. What do you see the Pharisees and Sadducees doing to Jesus Christ throughout the Gospels? Attacking him. They claim to be keepers of the law, but they actually teach for doctrines the commandments of men and do things for a big show to be seen of men. This 400 silent years, God has, God has not given people any new scriptures. They're living off of the Old Testament they already had. During this 400 silent years, Israel has obviously lost the crown. They don't have it. It's the devil getting a foothold around the world through these Gentile nations, their false gods, their false religions. The devil's going to use this time period, this 400 silent years, when Israel had been knocked off the throne to really wreak havoc on the entire world. And he's doing this right before the Son of God shows up. He's getting his foothold in the world. This, what, this makes Jesus Christ's ministry even more amazing. Because he steps on the scene when the devil has just soaked the world with sin and wickedness and just had a free-for-all. And right before and around this time is where you have the big false religions coming into play and getting a foothold. You got Brahmanism in the 7th century, six, around 656 B.C. You got Buddhism around 563 B.C. You got stuff like Confucianism around 551 B.C. And Taoism around 300 B.C. The devil's just using this time to get a real strong foothold in the world. And when Jesus Christ shows up, Israel's going to be in bondage to Rome just as they were in bondage to Egypt back in Exodus. So this makes Jesus Christ even more amazing. And he's really coming onto the devil's turf, the sinful world. He's going to take on the likeness of sinful flesh. He's going to come to the sinful world. He's given the devil so much of an advantage just to show out even more. He's going to go in Matthew chapter 4 and fast for 40 days and 40 nights because he knows the devil's coming. He's given the devil even more of an advantage, and he still wins easily. So that was the times of the Gentiles. That was a t uh, 400 silent years. That's the two topics we just looked at, the times of the Gentiles and the 400 silent years. In the next one, we're going to look at the first coming of Christ and the earthly ministry of Jesus.